Uh, my name is Peter Friesen. I'm the Director of Education. Welcome back to our virtual lecture series. This is our first one of the 2021 season uh, here in spring. It is April, which is Archaeology Month, which is always exciting for us. And uh, I know we're all excited for, for today's lecture. Uh, a few weeks ago, we made a big announcement about a, a very important discovery in the beginnings of a, of a wonderful project um, that I, I personally also look forward to, to seeing uh, evolve and develop and seeing how it shapes uh, what we do at Historic St. Mary's City. And so I'm speaking about the fort at St. Mary's or St. Mary's Fort and the People to People Project. And uh, this has been spearheaded and, and led by Dr. Travis Parno, who is our chief archaeologist, well, started off five years ago as our chief archaeologist, I should say, um, and then has uh, become the head of the, the director of our research department. Uh, Travis also continues to lead the field school uh, that we offer for college students and for young and up and coming archaeologists. Many archaeologists, uh, specifically historical archaeologists, uh, have gotten their chops started here at Historic St. Mary's City, one of the longest running field schools. So I know uh, Travis is, is proud to be part of that program um, and helping educate new young students. And I'm sure many of them are going to be very excited for this year's project and helping to uncover more about the fort and, and what lies under the ground there. So, and all of us are too waiting to see what happens. And uh, I don't know how much of an introduction I need to give for Travis because he has <clears throat> given a number of talks for the museum since he's begun. Um, but I think it's fair to say that, that Travis really has uh, inspired a lot of us to relook at how we view the past, the 17th century, and what the 17th century means to us as modern people and how colonialism has impacted all of our lives um, and brought people from different cultures uh, surrounding the Atlantic Ocean, what we often call the Atlantic world, together in one place, um, some with positive effects, some with negative effects. And I think this People to People project and the discovery of the fort really lends itself to that. And so I don't really want to have much more to say other than I want to bring Travis on and let him talk more about this amazing discovery and at the end, we will have opportunity for people to have a Q&A session. You can type it in to the chat on your YouTube. I believe I'm putting the right direction for where the chat is. If not, I will also put up a little email where you can email me at uh, education at digshistory.org, and I'll get those emails and I can read them online. I will, don't worry, I'll, I'll put that address in the chat. But without further ado, here is Dr. Pardo. Three, two, one. Welcome, Travis. Thanks so much, Peter, and I, I really appreciate the uh, the kind introduction. And I'm I'm happy to be here tonight to um, to share a little bit about the story of the discovery of St. Mary's Fort. And so, one of the things that I think is the most exciting about this discovery, um, you know, it's it's obviously a, a important story to Maryland history. Uh, when we think about the role that the, the early colonists played in establishing first the colony of Maryland and what we now know of as the state of Maryland, uh, St. Mary's Fort is, is the beginning of that. It's the, the anchor site where all of this really began. But um, I think what's also important to think about as is, is part of this story is exactly what life was like in this area even prior to the arrival of the, the Maryland colonists, that this was a incredibly diverse populated area with thousands of people who had had roots stretching back in this region for millennia. And, and it was into this world of, of complex social and political organization that the colonists uh, kind of inserted themselves in uh, March of 1634. And so today I'm going to talk about the, the discovery of the fort, certainly, and, and uh, a bit of what we we know about it from historical records and kind of the long uh, extenuated uh, search for the, the fort that culminated in our recent discovery. And, and then I'll talk at the end a little bit about kind of where we're going from here and how the project uh, is going to continue to evolve. Now, for those who are, are watching this evening who maybe aren't familiar with uh, where we are, historic St. Mary's City, we're tucked all the way down in, in St. Mary's County in Southern Maryland. And uh, historic St. Mary's City is a living uh, museum of living history and archeology, span um, really dedicated to telling the stories of the lives of the people who have called this, this part of the world home, um, particularly with an emphasis on, on Maryland's colonial capital. But 
Um, I think this project, as you'll see, really helps us tell a lot of the stories that led up to uh, the, the establishment of St. Mary's City. And this map here with the red circle really kind of shows the, the heart of our museum today, where you can see the most of the, the sort of living history interpretation right here along the St. Mary's River on the East Bank. Um, but our, our land stretches both north and south of this circle. Um, Historic St. Mary's City is established at the St. Mary's City National Historic Landmark, which encompasses over 800 acres of land, miles of shoreline, and over 100 different buildings. Uh, and so, um, you know, we really have a large area and a large, uh, you know, sort of large stories to tell as part of this, uh, this landscape. And, and those stories begin uh, thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, we know from archaeology um, that people have been using this, this land in Southern Maryland as a, uh, a home or at least a place to pass through, um, you know, uh, throughout the year for at least 12,000 years. You can see the, the artifacts shown on the image uh, or on the, the screen here on the upper right, this Palmer point. This is a, a projectile point that was found on our property a number of years ago. And, and this was made by someone in this region, you know, 10 to 12,000 years ago. And there have been other artifacts found uh, outside of historic St. Mary's City, but in Southern Maryland that date back even further, 13, 14,000 years. So we know for a long time this area has been uh, has been a, a great place to settle or at least to, to move through uh, where people could exploit uh, wild game, um, travel along the, the many rivers and tributaries. Uh, there's lots of natural springs all over the area that is uh, today St. Mary's City. And so there's been wonderful resources um, for, for, for years and years and years. And what I like to say is, you know, it, just like it was for the colonists, this has been a great place for people to live for, for a very, very long time. And what we know is that people started utilizing this space millennia ago. And yet over time, um, groups started to kind of cohere and, and, and uh, increase in size and in social complexity. Around 650 CE, we start to see the spread of corn uh, coming up from Mesoamerica. And that particular crop was, uh, was a key component that allowed people to start to become more sedentary and settle, ar settle around an area where they could grow this corn crop that would provide uh, you know, abundant resources that were predictable um, seasonally. And so as we see the rise of, of corn-based agriculture, we start to see uh, an increase in, in size of populations um, with, with different groups becoming more complex. Um, and, and in this case, with the native peoples of Southern Maryland, uh, you have groups starting to grow that are um, governed by chiefs or um, what we often call uh, werewances uh, in the Algonquian term. And these chiefs were advised by war leaders and elders and uh, tribal councils. And as this complexity starts to continue, we start to see larger groups, larger villages. And it's around, uh, you know, an interesting point in the archaeological record, around 1300 CE or so, where we start to see a change in how these villages are structured. Um, we start to see the, the rise of what we call palisaded villages, where you have native peoples constructing uh, essentially enclosures around their villages, whereas before we didn't tend to see this quite as much. And so you can see this, this uh, 17th century etching in the upper right hand corner illustrating a palisaded native village. And, and as an archaeologist and anthropologist, we're always asking the question, well, if you're building walls, you, know, you must have had a reason to do so. And, and so we start to, to try to speculate, is this a, a need for defense? Is there a rise of, of uh, conflict happening around this time in 1300? CE. And what's interesting is it's also around this time where we see some really important archaeological sites start to crop up in the record. And one of those uh, up, up north of here, sort of towards the, the nor northern end of the, the Potomac, um, is a site that's called the Akakit Creek site. And this is a, a very large uh, village, palisaded village settlement with um, a, a large population that we start to see around 1300 CE really starting to rise to prominence. There's some questions of, of what role this site played in the history of the people of this region, but what we know is that from uh, oral history and uh, uh, colonial records that it's around the same time that we see the rise of the Piscataway. The Piscataway are a group that uh, become the paramount chiefdom, the sort of uh, supreme power in what is today the western shore of Maryland. And so the Piscataway really come to dominate this region. And we know that the, the sort of seat of power of the Piscataway was at a site known as Moyone. Now, whether the Akakit Creek archeological site is the same as the, the uh, historical kind of seat of power at Moyone 
is is debatable. Um, and what's important to know is that that's a really important archaeological site that comes about around the same time that the Piscataway are rising to power. And the Piscataway were not the only tribe in this region. They, they had a number of other smaller groups that paid tribute to them. They were sort of the overarching power structure. And uh, there were a lot of other groups, you know, there, there were interactions up and down the East Coast um, to the north with the Iroquoian speaking groups, out to the west into the, the mountains and down south with other groups, you know, like the Powhatan uh, south of the Potomac. And so it's into this, this world of, of social and political complexity that about 150 or so colonists uh, under the leadership of Governor Leonard Calvert um, arrive in, in March of 1634 aboard the Ark and the Dove. And they, they sort of step into this world of, of different tribal entities, um, some who are, are um, in, in harmony and, and uh, working alongside the Piscataway and some who are in conflict with them. And so it's into this, this world that the colonists have, have inserted themselves. And as soon as they land, you know, they make landing at St. Clement's Island, there's a mass that's said, but uh, we know that, that Governor Calvert is keen to kind of make contact with the powers in this region. And so with the help of a, a fur trader who also speaks a bit of Algonquian, a man named uh, Henry Fleet, uh, they travel up north to the site of Moyon to meet with Juanis, the, the Tayac or, or paramount chief of the Piscataway people. And you have to sort of think about this encounter from the perspective of Juanis. You know, he he's aware of what European colonialism looks like, right? He's not someone who sort of looks at these these uh, white colonists who came in and said, you know, wow, my goodness, where did these people come from? He was intimately familiar with what uh, what the colonists in Virginia had been doing. He probably had word of what was going on in New England. And at this time, he's he's dealing with a bit of a challenge to his his leadership, we might say. Um, the Piscataway had been subjected to raids from a, a group known as the Susquehannocks coming down from uh, Pennsylvania, sort of what is today Pennsylvania, New York, been sailing down, uh, canoeing down into the, the northern part of the Chesapeake and raiding the Piscataway people. Another group called the Massawomack were coming from uh, the sort of panhandle of West Virginia, coming in from the west, uh, northwest. And then a group called the Patawomack had been raiding up from the south across the Potomac. And in fact, in 1623, the Patawomack actually allied with the Virginia colonial government um, to you know, join forces and go up and actually attack the Piscataway. So the uh, Wannis has, has sort of seen this, this situation evolve and he, he has this new group come in. He doesn't really need another enemy at this point. Um, he doesn't want to, to maybe upset the balance, but he also doesn't really want these colonists settling right in his backyard, sort of next to his seat of power. And so he kind of demures and says, you know, maybe don't come here, don't, uh, don't settle right here, but, you know, let's, let's be at peace. And so the colonists getting the hint um, with the advice of Henry Fleet end up sailing further south down the river to where Fleet knows there's a group of people called the Yakomako. And the Yakomako uh, had a, a uh, what we consider sort of an agricultural hamlet split across the, the western and the eastern banks of what we call today the St. Mary's River. And this village, also called Yakomako in the English colonial records, this is where the colonists decide might be a good spot for them. And so they, they land, they negotiate with the leadership of the Yakomako. And uh, the agreement that's recorded in the colonial documents is that the colonists are allowed to move into a vacated portion of the Yakomako village. And um, the Okomoko people actually move a across the riverbank over to the western side, where they're slightly more densely populated, where the, the Werewants uh, resides, and leave the east bank to the colonists. And they actually talk about vacating um, their, their witch out to their longhouses. The colonists record this in their records. And, and so the colonists move into this area where there's cleared land, where the Okomoko had been growing crops, um, and move into this area and immediately set about constructing a fort. St. Mary's Fort. And so the rendering that you see here, this wonderful drawing was created in 1972 by architectural historian, Kerry Carson. And it's a, a really fantastic rendering of what uh, at the time we thought St. Mary's Fort looked like. And this visual image is, is drawing in large part from the one good historical documented description that we have of St. Mary's Fort. And that comes from a letter that was written by uh, Maryland's first governor, Governor Leonard Calvert, to one of his friends and uh, one of the financiers for the colony, Sir Richard Letchford. And uh, so this letter is dated May 30th, 1634, so about two months after the colonists have landed. And he's you know, just talking to Letchford about all of the different economic circumstances surrounding uh, the colony. He talks about what the journey over was like. 
And then he provides a really tantalizing piece of data for us. And I'm going to show you this here. And he, uh, Calvert wrote, we have seated ourselves within one half mile of the river, within a palisado of 120 yards square with four flanks. We have mounted one piece of ordnance and placed six murderers in parts most convenient, a fortification we think sufficient to defend against any such weak enemies as we have reason to expect here. So this key description has so many different useful parts in it. So if we kind of break this down and really you know, probe this description, he says, we've seated ourselves within one half mile of the river, right? So this gives us the, the, the hint that we should be looking with for a site within a half mile of the river. Um, he describes the fort as being a palisado or a palisaded fort. You know, just like the, the native peoples of this region starting to uh, build palisades around their villages, a palisaded fort was a very common colonial style uh, sort of military defensive architecture. Essentially, you're taking uh, timbers, stripping branches off of them, stacking them side by side in a trench, filling that trench in, and you've created a really tall, sometimes you know, 10, 12, 14 feet tall, um, difficult to penetrate wooden barrier around your, your, uh, your settlement. So we've got a palisaded fort. It's 120 yards square. So, you know, we're looking for a square fort, 360 feet on the side with four flanks. Now, this is the one sort of phrase that's always given us a little, uh, a little bit of a hiccup. We, we think flanks, you know, why describe something as square with four sides, right? Um, and so the, the four flanks we tend to interpret as a, one of those 17th century misspellings of the word flanker, which was a classic sort of military term that means a bastion or a bulwark or sort of an outwork um, it would be built on a corner or on a, a projecting side of a fort that would allow a defender to enter that bastion or bulwark and fire along the walls if someone is storming your fort. So we assume from this description, we've got a, a square palisaded fort with bastions likely on the corners, if it's a square. Um, they've mounted one cannon, one piece of ordnance, and then he talks about six murderers, which are sort of like a, almost like a shotgun cannon, like a shorter version of a cannon for firing. Uh, often sort of uh, firing on, on um, humans rather than firing on ships, but sort of depends on, on where you're using it. So we've got at least seven, seven different um, cannon mounted at this time. And then he describes the, the weak enemies they might have reason to expect. And weak enemies could mean a lot of different things, but from a, a European perspective, weak enemies likely means, in this case, uh, native enemies, sort of native attackers, as opposed to, say, other Europeans like Virginians or uh, in Spanish, which weren't really a, as much of a concern at this point, a generation after after the Jamestown colony. So we've got all of these useful pieces of information. If we come back to Carson's drawing, this is what he's rendered, right? We've got this beautiful large square fort with these these big corner bastions. You can see these large circular cannon emplacements here with big trenches in front of them. Uh, maybe we're not exactly half a mile from the river, but that's okay. It's it's a picturesque location that that Dr. Carson has chosen. And a couple other useful pieces that you can get out of this drawing. For one, if you notice in this, this sort of section on kind of the, near the Western Bulwark, you've got structures that look for all the world like uh, witch huts or longhouses. And this code sort of goes along with the colonial documentation that the colonists, when they first settled in the area, actually moved into some of these witch huts, which sort of makes sense, right? You've been at sea for three or four months. You arrive here. You, it's going to take you some time to build your, your sort of classic English timber frame house that you're going to live in. And so you lay your head in any sort of warm uh, enclosure that you can find. And in fact, if you look sort of in the, just outside the front of the fort here, Dr. Carson has rendered one of these uh, witch huts with a big cross in front of it. That's because Father Andrew White, the Jesuit missionary who described a lot of the, the conditions of the early settlement actually talked about holding mass in one of these witch huts as they waited for the, the, the chapel to be built. So you've got this fort with this mix of architecture, some native architecture, some English architecture. Uh, and, and as you can tell from this image, this is a pretty substantial enclosure that had at least 150 colonists living in it in the beginning and probably more as, as the early years wore on. And yet we couldn't find the darn thing. I mean, we have uh, you know almost 50 years of, of archaeology conducted at historic St. Mary's City, and we found so much about uh, the life of early Maryland, right? We found some good early 17th century sites um, we've got a really great sense of the, the formal Baroque town plan that came to dominate the town in, in the 1660s and 70s. We've seen formal architecture. We've, we've found houses. We found so much, but the fort was that piece that, that remained elusive for a long time. Now, there are a couple complications for why this thing could be difficult to find archaeologically. 
And so it, if we look at the facts, we know that the fort construction began in the spring of 1634. And then about seven years later, there was a, a chunk of land in the middle of the, the 17th century town that was patented by Governor Calvert called Governor's Field, right? It's the governor's land. He patents this land as Governor's Field. And so he has this territory that includes the area of St. Mary's Fort. And so what we get the sense is that the, he's patenting this land and saying, you know, this is the governor's land. It's time for you all to start moving out of the fort and start settling along the riverways where you can establish a proper tobacco plantation and really sort of get the economy going and get the settlement going. And he goes so far as in the following year, 1642-43, of actually issuing expulsion orders saying, oh, it really is time to move along. This fort is not really necessary at this stage. And so that tells us the fort was really only occupied for about eight or nine years, which is not a long time uh, as, as far as um, uh, people leaving a material signature on the landscape that an archaeologist can find. And the most intensive period of occupation was probably the first three, four years that the colonists were here. We also have the, the added factor that in the early 17th century, um, those, those archaeological sites, at least at St. Mary's City, tend to have slightly lower artifact densities. There's just not the body of material culture that has been brought over. Uh, uh, so we don't tend to see quite as high of a, an uh, uh, archaeological signature for those sites. It's not always the case. The St. John's site has a wonderful archaeological signature, 1638. But um, for early 17th century periods like this, it can sometimes be a little challenging. Now, there's been the, the reason that this has sort of stuck around, it's sort of loomed large in the minds, I think, of, of a lot of us. And, and it really is a search that goes back almost 90 years. And I show this just to give you a sense of, you know, when I moved into my office, I was, I was a chief archaeologist uh, when I started. And I was my predecessor, Dr. Tim Reardon, who did a lot of really important work in this search, had this comic hanging in his office just to give. And I, I, when I walked in, it really gave me that, that sense that people really have been looking for this thing for a while. So I, I moved it into my office where it still hangs today. Um, but, you know, the search has been going on for a very long time, dating back to really the, the early 20th century, when we first start to see scholars going out and saying, where is this thing? And so we've had these two kind of competing theories that have, have stuck with us for a while. We have these two areas of the site where we think, you know, maybe the fort could be located in one of these two spots. One of them is called the traditional site. I'll explain why, why we, you know, sort of tradition holds that the fort could be there. And the other is called the mill field. And I'll talk about that one um, second. Now, the traditional site, of course, is so-called because tradition holds. That that's where the, the fort has has uh, was buried, and and that dates back to the work of an architectural historian by the name of Henry Chanley Foreman. And Foreman was this this uh, great architectural historian who did work at St. Mary's City. He did some excavations at Jamestown, particularly in the, the new town area of Jamestown. He was really interested in monumental brick architecture. That was really his focus. So he was on the hunt for a lot of years in the, the late twenties, thirties, and into the early forties, looking at both of these sites for. For major brick buildings. And he published some of his, his findings in 1938 in this wonderfully titled book, Jamestown and St. Mary's Buried Cities of Romance. And the, the image that I show under this is, is the printed image on the inside of the back cover um, with a sort of the sketch map that he's created of what 17th century St. Mary's city looked like. And what you should notice here is in this circle, you can see the fort, 1634, this little square thing with, with four bastions on the corners. And so if we look at where that is on the landscape, this is again, jumping back to our aerial photo here and kind of put our, our uh, Foreman book to the side, you'll see there's St. Mary's Fort. And that's the area on the landscape that he was really interested in. And he writes about how this is a, a logical location. And it does make a lot of sense. If you're going to build your fort, uh, you know, with and mount it with all of this, this sort of bristling cannon that, that Calvert is talking about, and we know of the one piece of ordinance, there's more that gets added. Uh, down the road, or at least brought into the colony, um, that you want your cannon potentially to control the riverways, because that's where you're, if you're worried about Spanish, if you're worried about Virginians, even if you're worried about Native people coming by canoe, they're going to be coming up the river. And so you want to construct your fort right along the river bank, where before those ships or boats sort of arrive at your shore, you've peppered them full of, of shot. And if you think about where uh, James Fort is relative to the James River, right, for a long time, people thought that James Fort had actually um, you know, sort of eroded into the river, um, but it was sited right there on the, the banks. And so there, there was a thought that maybe the same thing was done at St. Mary's City. And you can see Foreman continuing and perpetuating this idea uh, as we move forward into the 20th century, this, 
this wonderful map that was created by uh, by Dr. Foreman, but also with the the crucial assistance of Spence Howard Jr., a, a local resident who was really, really deeply dedicated to the preservation of Maryland history. And so Foreman and, and Spence worked together to create this map in the mid 60s when, at the time when St. Mary's College was starting to sort of spread its wings and was gonna be growing into a, a four year co-ed institution, Foreman and Howard had the, the insight and the foresight really to be concerned about what that development could mean for the buried resources of St. Mary's City. And so they prepared this wonderful map showing sort of all of the documented um, uh, pieces of, of cultural material that the, the two of them kind of knew together. And you'll see right in that same spot, you've got the traditional site of St. Mary's Fort 1634. So again, this, this location makes a lot of sense from a, a military perspective. The one piece that doesn't quite fit with this is, of course, Governor Calvert's letter where he talks about, we walked one half mile inland and there, you know, we built our fort. This is not exactly half a mile inland, but perhaps he was referring to the colonists landing and then walking half a mile up the shore as opposed to in. Hard to really, hard to really tell. Uh, but we did have some good archaeology that supported the, the traditional site as, as a possibility. We conducted some controlled surface collection uh, back in the early 90s. And controlled surface collection, just like you see in this image here, essentially involves a, a farmer coming through and plowing up the land. Um, so it's freshly tilled up. And then we, the archaeologists, come in and grid out that land in 10 foot squares and go pick up all the artifacts off the surface that we see. And then we map them by according to which grid square they came in. And where you see concentrations of material that have been plowed up, we know that uh, there, there are likely sites beneath the further beneath the, the ground surface that are present in those areas. And so in the area of the traditional site with the surface collection, it revealed a kind of a concentration right there along the shore of some early 17th century ceramics, some good pipes, some early beads, you know, glass trade beads that would be brought over for exchange with native peoples. One of those artifacts that we tend to associate with early 17th century sites and also a concentration of gun flint. And, and it's one of those things with St. Mary's City where you see gun flints and beads together tends to, to represent an earlier occupation. So we had some good archeology span that was suggestive of, of this site being viable. The other site that we were really interested in was a site called the Mill Field, which is this, what is today about a 14 acre field just north of Maryland Route 5. And you can see the, the red arrow pointing to it here. And the reason we were interested in this area um, is it was located right along this creek that I've just outlined here. This is Mill Creek, so named because there were a couple mills that were built along it in the early 17th century. And towards the eastern end of that little blue line, actually a little bit further than where that line goes, um, there's a spring called Governor's Spring that provides fresh water that feeds that creek that uh, would have originally led out down into the river. So you've got a natural source of, of spring water right there very level ground. Uh, it's almost exactly half a mile inland from the river, depending on you know either, almost either way you go, it's, it's half a mile inland. And archeology span tells us that there's some really interesting stuff out there. Um, another surface collection survey that was done back in, in the early 1980s, 1984, um, looked at about the Northern half of the mill field and looked at all the artifacts that were found there. And there were first some, some really interesting concentrations of pre-colonial material. These two red circles are highlighting areas where there were large concentrations of what we call lithic debitage, or the broken pieces that result from making stone tools. Um, on the eastern circle, sort of southeast, that, that second one on the right-hand side, there were some uh, ceramics that dated back to, you know, about five, between five and, and uh, 500 and 2,000 years old. So uh, a lot of really, really early, uh, interesting pre-colonial material. But there were some concentrations of colonial material as well in a few different areas. Some of these were, were denser than others, but um, there are some really intriguing what we call site components, the idea that there might be some sort of site or a piece of a site buried below this area. And so this, is a, this map is one of our sort of our internal maps showing all of the different sites that are present in this field. And if you look at all the different site components that have been identified, this is all just in this one sort of 14 acre field where we've got lots of different sort of small concentrations, in some cases, larger concentrations of, of pre-colonial and colonial and post-colonial uh, material. And so clearly this, this little kind of postage stamp in our world has been an area of occupation for a very, very long time. So the surface collection told us there's a lot happening out there, both pre-colonial and certainly some early 17th century colonial material on kind of the eastern side of that, that field. 
And this led, uh, again, to go back to my, my predecessor, Dr. Tim Reardon, to publish a really important article in 1991 called The Location of Fort St. Mary's, a Speculative Essay. And this article was based off of that surface collection that was done in the 80s. And, and Tim sort of mapped out where the concentrations of particularly early material were found and kind of drew some lines. And you can see in this image here, he's got, you know, Fort Wall, question mark. You know, could this be where St. Mary's Fort was located? Um, and this, the artifacts that he, he's shown in this map are things like um, English gun flints. Again, those kinds of things that we tend to associate with early 17th century sites, along with a couple cannonball was really interesting to come out of that surface collection, not a, not a super common artifact for us. So the following year in 1992, uh, Tim led excavations out in the mill field, found all kinds of material dating from the, the um, pre-colonial um, archaic woodland period material from, from native peoples all the way up to the post-colonial period. But there's some really intriguing concentrations of early 17th century um, objects along with what, what Tim called uh, you know, one of the largest fence lines he had ever seen. That always really kind of stuck with me, this idea that he had found a very robust fence line in this area. And so one of the things that I often get asked, because this is really the last archaeological investigation, the last major work that was done out in the Millfield, it's 1992, almost 30 years ago. Uh, I often get asked, you know, why didn't, why didn't he go back? Why didn't he do another season out there in the Millfield? That's because there was a lot happening at St. Mary's City um, from 1992 up to the present. The first, for those who, who know us, up in the upper left-hand corner here, you see an image of the three lead-encased uh, coffins that, that bore the remains of Philip Calvert, uh, his first wife, Ann Wolsey Calvert, and then his, uh, his baby boy um, from his second wife in that small coffin. This was a, a major, major discovery that happened the fall after uh, Tim's uh, work out in the mill field and, and ended up being a major discovery um, news, national news, international news, um, hundreds of people worked on that project. So that occupied a lot of time. But then all of these other images, I couldn't even fit enough images on this screen to really uh, get the whole point across. But almost every building historical reconstruction that you see on our landscape today came about between 1992 and today. So um, the, the reason we didn't go back out to the mill field before now is because we were, we were busy doing a heck of a lot of other things. So again, comparing these two sites, you know, the traditional site, it's got the advantage that it commands the river. Archaeology shows some early ceramics, flint, beads, but is it does it really fit with that, that description from Governor Calvert at within one half mile? Um, the mill field, on the other hand, does fit that description. It's got some early artifacts, including flint and, and cannonballs, but it doesn't command the river, right? There's not a lot of military use for, for trying to uh, line your cannon up and fire against ships from that location. Now, I said there wasn't a lot of other major archaeology done uh, since 92, and I've summarized most of the high points, but um, I do get some questions sometime about one other time that, that we, we did some searching for St. Mary's Fort, and that was in association with a British show, wonderful, wonderful show called Time Team, um, that involved uh, a, a group of British archaeologists really going to, uh, to different archaeological sites, trying to help out uh, with the, the different groups and, and really, you know, find what they can find in, in three days, I think they usually advertise it as. Uh, and so in 1997, Time Team filmed their very first episode outside of the UK, and they happened to film it here at St. Mary's City. Uh, and you can see Henry up at the top with Mick Aston um, there as one of the Time Team members. And you can see from this map in the bottom left-hand corner, it's, it can be a little tough to tell, but the, the question of St. Mary's Fort was, was did loom large at this time. And you, the person who's pointing their finger is pointing at the traditional site. And what you can see highlighted just right over here, this is the mill field. Uh, so that was an area that they were maybe interested in looking. You also have the chapel shown across the street here and then a, a late 17th century brick mansion, in St. Peter's that was looked at. And so the question of, of where is the fort was, uh, was a big one at this time. And they did some looking in the traditional site using some geophysics, um, a few different uh, geophysical uh, methods. And I'll talk about geophysics in a bit here. Um, but what you can see in that upper right-hand corner is an image, uh, a screenshot from the episode from Time Team, because their geophysicists, in looking at aerial photos, became convinced that the fort was actually in a different location than we had we had identified previously. And so he came up with this outline um, showing this sort of trapezoidal fort. And, and, and I think it was a, a really intriguing idea, but what we at St. Mary's City always felt was that what, what had been identified as part of that, that possible fort outline was actually related to something much more, much more recent, and that was uh, the the tercentennial celebration, Maryland's 300th birthday in 1934, that brought about 200,000 people 
to Southern Maryland. And this, this shot here kind of looking out to St. Mary's River shows just the density of, of cars and tents and, and people that uh, participate in this celebration. But what you should note is the bandstands that are outlined in this area here forming roughly a trapezoid. And so our thought has always been that the impressions that the, the uh, British uh, time team folks were seeing were actually the, the remnants sort of left behind by these, these bandstands from uh, 1934 as opposed to a 1634 fort. But it was a really neat experience um, for those who were able to be involved. Um, and unfortunately, they never got over to test the mill field. So when I arrived here in, at St. Mary City in 2016, um, you know, again, I was the chief archaeologist at that time, and I was really interested in this idea of can we find St. Mary's Fort and can we do it without digging all over creation? Um, you know, could we apply other methods to really looking for this fort? I had spent some time as an undergraduate student at uh, Jamestown. You know, I, I did my field school there. I worked there um, after I completed my field school. And so I've always had a, a strong affinity for these really early colonial sites just because I've seen firsthand how, how they really capture the public's imagination. People get really excited about the, these kinds of sites. And so it felt like a missing piece to me. Um, and so in 2017, I applied for and received a grant through the Maryland Historical Trust um, with matching support from the Historic St. Mary City Foundation. Uh, and, and we were able to use those funds to hire a geophysicist, uh, shown here three times, uh, Dr. Tim Horsley, who is uh, one of the preeminent geophysicists, uh, certainly in this country and arguably in the world, um, he's got a deep familiarity with, with Maryland in particular, having done uh, more than 20 projects. In fact, at this point, it's probably more than 30 projects in Maryland. And so uh, Tim and I got together and we sort of hammered out this approach that would take his, his instrumentation using different techniques, in this case, magnetic susceptibility, magnetometry, and ground penetrating radar, to use this instrumentation to look in both of these areas, at the traditional site and at the Millfield site, uh, and, and look below the ground without having to actually, uh, you know, actually do any excavations. And so this image here showing Dr. Horsley with his ground penetrating radar, which um, ultimately proved to be the most useful uh, component of the survey. The first two elements, the magnetic susceptibility and the magnetometry, didn't really reveal a whole lot. And uh, this was in 2018 when Tim was doing this work. It, it showed us some interesting things, but it wasn't like uh, we'd suddenly seen the fort, you know, jump out of his, his data. And I was starting to sweat it a little bit, you know, I was getting a little nervous, you know, maybe we didn't have it, maybe it was not either of these two sites. And so Tim had planned to come in, in September of 2018 to do the ground penetrating radar survey. And uh, as luck would have it, a hurricane came through at that time, for those who remember uh, in that, that time. So he had to reschedule his visit and he ended up rescheduling it for, oh, I'm sorry, there's a fire alarm going on here. It, it's been malfunctioning for the last couple of days, so I apologize if that's really um, it should turn off shortly. Uh, I'll just try and I'll just try and so, all right. Um, so uh, Tim ended up coming back uh, in, in the fall of 2018 uh, in November, and yes, yeah, November. And at that time, I was actually away from the site on vacation, um, and he ended up texting me you know, while I'm away, and he says, "I think we have it." And so what he was looking at is this ground penetrating radar data. It essentially, the radar is sending radar waves into the soil, and they bounce up off of anything that's like a very foundation, um, anything like a concentration of uh, artifacts. And uh, that radar gets, gets kind of, uh, the radar gets, gets received by the instrumentation, and we're able to map where those anomalies are. Uh, and so what you can see from his data, him that I did, this is his data right here. And so what you can hopefully see is a dark line sort of coming down to the southwest right here, the straight line. And what Tim always says is, is nature doesn't work in straight lines. You know, this is a, a human-made anomaly. So we've got a straight line coming here. It sort of curves out this way. You should, it's really faint, but hopefully you can see that. And then this line shoots down to the southeast, comes to a corner, and then starts to come up. You kind of lose it in here, but we can see another straight line coming right in this area on the northeast side. And so to give you a little clearer image of this, this is the, the sort of interpretive map um, showing what Tim had identified. And this is an area I should mention that's about the size of a football field. It's a very huge sort of rectangular area. And, and that line is, consists of, of black dots. And those dots are signifying individual posts that, that uh, Dr. Horsley was able to identify as part of his survey. 
And so what he has found are these this huge row of posts, likely from a palisade fence um, that, that encloses this area that's, again, about the size of a football field. So this is really intriguing. Now, for those who are, are remembering from the, the earlier part of this, you know, the description that Governor Calvert gave, he describes a, a, a square, you know, fort or, uh, you know, it's 120 yard square with four uh, flankers or four bastions as we've interpreted it. And what you see here is, is a rectangle, not a square. Uh, and this measures about 104 yards on the long end and about 59 yards, 58 yards on the short end. So it's not exactly the same size that Calvert mentioned. And this thing that we have here, this sort of uh, very clear looking outwork or bastion on the, the Western side, we don't really have that repeated on the rest of the uh, the rest of the, the corners. We really only see that one. So this was intriguing. And, and I'm just gonna show you this, this additional map here. This is the much more detailed version of Dr. Horsley's maps and all of the dots and shapes and various things that you see here are other individual components that were identified as part of this geophysical survey. So it was really a, a huge amount of data that came out of this work. And I'm just gonna run through really quickly to highlight a few of these. First is that, that bastion that I mentioned over on the Western side. And again, with the zoomed in version, you can see hopefully this line of black dots in here, each one of these representing the traces of a post that's been left behind in the ground. You can see where it sort of curves out and makes this large circular enclosure. That circle is about 22 feet in diameter. Towards the north side of this enclosure, you can see an area where each of these green dots again represents a, a, the remains of, likely remains of a post. And what you can see hopefully from this is that we've got sort of lines, almost like a grid of these green circles, um, likely representing to me, you know, for an, an archeologist, we look at this and we think this is English colonial architecture, right? Each of these dots is sort of a large structural post and you've got maybe studs or sills, um, you know, sort of representing the rest of the timber frame. And then this big red rectangle is actually a very deep feature, probably something that's three and a half, four feet deep. And a big deep rectangle to us again, looks like a cellar. So it appears that we have English architecture with a deep cellar in this portion of the enclosure. But what's really fascinating is over on the east end of the, the enclosure and then towards the south of the survey area, we have some other sort of shapes. And again, looking at the shape that these, these green sort of circles make as posts, you've got kind of a rounded rectangle in here. And then this area looks sort of like a, a large circular shape. And then down to the south of the survey area, these yellow dots, again, representing posts, two concentric circles. Now, this is not uh, the kind of, of form that the English colonists built in. This appears to our eyes to look like the possibility of, of uh, native architecture, which is not something we have found definitively here at St. Mary's City. So it's really exciting. Now, the thing about a geophysical survey is it suggests to us what might lie below the ground, but it doesn't tell us anything about when that uh, those features might date to. Right? If these are indeed witch huts or some form of, of native architecture, they could be 400, roughly 400 years old, you know, around the time that the colonists were here as part of the village of Yakomiko. They could be 2,000 years old. You know, we just won't know until we do any archaeology. And the same thing is true with that enclosure. As much as it, it looked to us like this looks like a fort uh, to our eye, we needed to get in and actually do some excavation to, to really get a, a sense of it and see if we could date it. Uh, because it could be something that dated to uh, a later conflict, right? It could be a uh, late 17th century enclosure of some sort. So in the summer of 2019, with the help of the uh, field school of 2019, even though they didn't know it, uh, again, uh, we started uh, we started doing some excavations over around. Sorry about that, everybody. I know um, that was causing issues for many people with trying to hear. And so I just briefly took Travis down from the screen until that gets figured out. So do apologize um, and we'll get this straightened out as soon as we can.
All right. I, I know I had to mute him. I know it was causing issues, everybody. That was very loud. And I, I know Travis was getting to some really good stuff, so I didn't want anybody to miss it and, and deal with all that. So um, thank you for understanding. I think it has stopped now. I just got a message from Travis. So I want to bring him back and we will continue. Thanks for bearing with us. All right, I'm so sorry, folks. Uh, this is the joys of, of presenting from from a residence instead of presenting from uh, from for in person. I promise I'm not about to be burned alive. Um, so, uh, getting back to the the what we were talking about in 2019, these excavations revealed a portion of this trench. Again, the Palisade Trench. It appeared to be, at least, it matched where the geophysics suggested we would find this trench. But to really get into it, you know, we could tell. All right, this is where. We expected to find it, but we needed to do some excavation into the feature itself. So this section of the, the trench we chose for excavation here, this northern kind of 10 foot section. And as you can see from these photographs, this thing was very deep, just like Tim talked about from his excavations in 92. Uh, this was the deepest fence line that I had ever worked in. This is about a three foot deep fence trench. And what you can see, these shapes along the bottom, these are the, the molds that were left behind by individual timbers that were part of this fence line. And you can see here, this is a full-sized round timber, a smaller round timber. And then each of these shapes represents sort of a quarter or half timber that was part of a palisade fence. And you can see an example of a, what a palisade fence would look like when it's fully constructed down there on the bottom. Uh, so based on the, the, the robustness of this feature, the, the artifacts that were found inside, we, and the geophysics itself, we felt pretty good by the end of 2019 saying, you know, yes, it does look like we have in fact discovered the location of St. Mary's Fort. And so um, we ended up uh, commissioning a sort of a conjectural sketch, kind of pairing with Carrie Carson's drawing, but really updated to show what we think St. Mary's Fort looked like based off of the geophysical survey. And so you can see here this large rectangular enclosure with the one uh, bastion over on the western side. Um, on the interior, we have, we've, we've chosen to portray what we're calling kind of firing platforms because the geophysics is suggesting there might've been some form of architecture built on the inside of the wall to provide a space that the colonists could have fired over without actually necessitating kind of an outwork or a bastion. You'll also see from this sketch, we've, we've mixed up the, the sort of native architecture shown over on the Eastern side with these witch shots, again, sort of representing the possibility that the archeology span may show us that those structures date to the early 17th century. So it's a, a really exciting, obviously exciting find, a massive site that has a lot of work uh, that we need to put into it. And we have started doing a bit more work in there since uh, last July with uh, support from the governor's office. We've been doing some excavations in the northern part of the fort. And for those who know us, you'll see the stuff in the, this image looks kind of familiar. This is the kind of thing that we find most commonly, sort of broken up bits of things, small fragments of brick, pieces of ceramic, um, things that have gotten chewed up by the, the agricultural plowing that's gone on in our landscape over the last 350 years or so. But we have found some things that are, are really exciting. Uh, over here on the left-hand side, you can see this is a fragment of German stoneware, uh, a decorative medallion that would have, would have sat on the side of sort of a globular jug, dates to around 1550 to 1650. Um, the other three items that you see on the, the slide here are uh, trade beads. Um, on the, the upper two are made out of glass, and the one on the bottom is actually a hand carved stone, that faceted stone. These would have been produced possibly in Venice, likely somewhere on the continent and brought over for trade with native peoples. Now, because we're, we're dealing with a, a familiar audience here, I wanted to share with you some more recent finds. And when I say recent, these things still have dirt on them. These came out of the ground literally last week. And so we had a pretty good week last week, found some really exciting things. The first is a, a lithic or, or stone awl you know, a small object would have been about yay big, would have originally had a point on it. This one has a, um, the point was broken off, but this would have been used for punching uh, holes in leather as part of, of tanning and leather working, um, likely done by, by native peoples. We also have this really neat uh, copper alloy tinkling cone. This is a sort of a, a, a kind of cone, really thin shaped piece of copper that's wrapped in a cone, would have been strung on a knotted piece of leather um, and would have been worn as a form of, of personal adornment or jewelry again, likely by native peoples. It's unclear who manufactured it. It could have been manufactured by Europeans for trade, um, but we're, we're looking forward to investigating that a little more fully. And then we had this, this really wonderful um, copper alloy five saints medal. This is a religious medal um, showing, this is showing both sides. And you can see on the, the right-hand image, you've got five figures 
um, representing the, the five uh, individuals who were canonized by Pope Gregory in 1622. And included among those five were Ignatius Loyola and Francis Xavier, two of the key um, saints in the, the Jesuit tradition. And so being a very, having a lot of Jesuit roots here, this, this makes a lot of sense for us. On the left-hand side, you've got two angels who are, are kneeling next to the sacrament. So really a wonderful find. We found another one of these uh, very similar over at Pope's Fort, which is a 1645 site. And we found some other um, particularly Jesuit uh, religious medals out in the mill field as part of some of the earlier work that was done out there. So this was, was a really exciting one uh, last week. Some of the other things that are, are a little less recent, um, in the upper left, you've got an iron object. This is part of a 17th century musket. This is a what we call a trigger guard. This is a piece that did exactly that. It would have, would have formed a guard that, that moved, sort of curved around the trigger of the musket. And I've shown a, a picture of a 17th century musket here. So you can see this is the trigger guard right in here. And the piece that we have is, is really just like what I just sort of circled. This piece here, you can see where it attaches to the stock. It's kind of a triangular piece. That's exactly what we have on this metal object here. So we've got parts of guns and we have um, at the bottom there a piece of English gun flint that would have been used to provide the spark to fire the musket. And we've been finding plenty of, of the lead ammunition that would have been used in, in these muskets. The, the, my two crew members here are holding, each have a handful of lead shot of different caliber that was found in two adjacent five by five foot units. So we're seeing really significant numbers of lead shot. Um, what I'm sort of calling the, the the tools of colonialism, if you will. We see there's a strong military presence here. We see evidence of trade and we see evidence of uh, religious uh, proselytization. We're also finding evidence of, of native peoples, of course. You know, I mentioned we, we know that this area was used for a long time um, by, by people before the colonists arrived. The projectile point on the left-hand side was likely made about 4,500 years ago. And uh, the piece of ceramic that's marked with, uh, with a cord uh, wrapped paddle uh, to provide that decoration on the right hand side was likely made sometime around 2000 to 2400 years ago. So we see this presence out there on the landscape and as we started to you know, really kind of getting into this project in earnest we decided that, that maybe we needed to rethink our approach to this. And I'm just going to go back to this, this image that I showed you previously where the surface collection showed these really large pre-colonial site components out here in the mill field. And what we realized was that the site of St. Mary's Fort is just, it's too important of a moment in Maryland history. That, that moment, like I said, of where the colonists were, were sort of entering this world of, of social and political complexity. But it's too important to treat St. Mary's Fort as a colonial site in and of itself. And that what we really needed to do was widen our focus and maybe treat the entire mill field, this sort of 14 acre part of our property as a kind of laboratory to really investigate and understand human occupation in this region over thousands of years and treat St. Mary's Fort as almost a sort of a punctuation mark, you know, that point in which everything changed. And so what we've done is we've, we've reached out to members of the, the Piscataway community in particular, the Piscataway Kanoi tribe, the Piscataway Indian Nation, um, various other groups in the, the area. And um, we're gonna be doing a collaborative endeavor to investigate these, these three different sites out here in the mill field. And you can see the two circled in red are those, those potential sites that were identified through the 1984 surface collection and then St. Mary's Fort shown in blue. And so this collaborative endeavor working with our, our native community members hand in hand um, to design this research to really see what the investigation is gonna look like. And then most importantly, since we're a state museum, what the public interpretation is gonna be, what kinds of stories we're going to tell out here. And our hope is that in, in some number of years, once we've been able to investigate these sites, that a visitor will be able to come and park in this, this sort of parking lot that you see over here on the left-hand side and really walk the mill field. And in doing so, walk the thousands of years of human history in this area, starting with the oldest site over here on the, the west side, ending with the, you know, moving into the, the more recent site. Again, this one's about 500 to 2000 years old. The Western site is about 3000 to 5000 years old. And then end at St. Mary's Fort to really see the moment when uh, the colonists really changed everything in this landscape and tell all of these stories together with our community members. And so this is what, uh, what Peter was referring to earlier as the People to People Project. Uh, and you can, I encourage you to check out our website, peopletopeopleproject.org, where you can learn some more information about the ethos of the project, um, the history of the two, the different sites that are, are out there in the mill field, and um, really kind of how we're gonna be approaching this moving forward into the future. And I think you can see here, we, we're looking at how we can really use this massive area to tell really complex human stories over thousands of years of history.
So we expect that this project is going to occupy our time for a number of years moving into the future, but we're really looking forward to seeing what comes next. Um, so as I'm going to end things uh, here, but I do want to run through just a few thank yous for um, folks who have really, really been integral in this process, uh, starting with our you know, Governor Hogan's office and our, our legislative, particularly uh, Senator Bailey, Delegate Crosby, who have just been so supportive of all of the work that we're doing um, and, and really driving a lot of attention our way. Uh, to my fellow team members with the People to People Project, uh, Dr. Gabrielle Tayak, Francis Gray, Rico Newman, and uh, Dr. Tim Horsley. Um, to those members of the Native community who have, have been willing to come to the table with us and have conversations about what this history can mean for all of us and how we can work together to, uh, to really investigate it. Um, the support from the Maryland Historical Trust and the, the St. Mary City Foundation um, is what really drove a lot of this. And we have another grant from them, uh, from the trust that we'll be, we'll be digging into this area in a little bit more detail. Uh, the Maryland Department of Commerce, continued support from Lucille Walker. Uh, St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office has been helping us out with security. Um, some very generous donors have supported this, this project. Um, we have some wonderful folks like uh, Isabel Tonkovich, Jane Kostenko, who, who have given up themselves to this, this effort. Uh, of course, our, our interns from St. Mary's College, um, the wonderful field school class of 2019, our media team that's been helping us out with this, and uh, of course, Chuck Fithian and, and Dr. Tim Rudin himself, who has just been so supportive of this work. Um, and so thank you to all of these people and anyone else that, that I could have forgotten. Uh, it's a really exciting project, and uh, I can't wait to take it forward into the future. So thanks so much for your time tonight, for bearing with the fire alarms, and uh, I appreciate the chance to speak with you about this. All right. Well, thank you, Travis. That was wonderful and very in-depth. I think one of the more in-depth presentations I have seen yet of this uh, since I first started hearing about it a couple of years ago myself. Uh, so thank you. And I know we are going to be having some questions. We already have some questions. Um, I'm just going to, again, uh, put up on the screen uh, for anybody who does not have the ability to use YouTube, um, uh, our, my email address that you can email me at. Uh, so one second, I thought I had it ready to go and I didn't. Um, but while we're, we're waiting for other questions to come in, I had one uh, that when I was preparing for tonight's lecture and, and thinking about what I wanted to do for an introduction and Thinking back, uh, like how long you've been here, Travis, and, and me being a historian by trade, we like to look at the written record and, and we are very fond of our anniversaries. I realized today is the anniversary of your job interview here at Historic St. Mary's City. Very timely. Five years ago today. <laughs> very and timely, so yes. It is, I, I, I find it very timely. And so it makes me wonder, now hearing that from, from me, what were you, were you thinking that you'd be here five years ago? What, what were you possibly thinking? Um, I was thinking, I can't believe I get to work at a site that has an archeological record as incredible as, as the one at St. Mary City. And I, I continue to think that every day. I mean, we have the, it, it's, it's a gem of gems really um, in thinking about the, the preservation and the, the, the depth of, of stories that we can really access dating back again, thousands of years, but the, the 17th century history, the 18th and 19th century history, the 20th century history. I mean, we have it all. And, and you just don't find that at a lot of places around the country. And often when, when you do, it's been disturbed by development. And that's just not what we have here. So um, I remember just being giddy that I was going to get to work on a site like this. And again, I, I, I feel the same way every day. It's a uh, it's pretty awesome place. Yeah, that was a very neat, interesting uh, anniversary. So let me get to one question, it looks like this question was also answered by another guest, but I want to go ahead and put it up there. Um, and I want to read the rest of it. Uh, why was the Baltimore area depopulated if it was just the result of European diseases? Why didn't the Susquehannock take advantage of the area and instead press onto the Southern Maryland? I think that's a good question. I mean, I think they were, they were definitely pressing, you know, as far as, as, as maybe they needed to, or as far as they dared, um, you know, it was it was as much a, a continue to move down and get access to trade networks. Um, you know, that was really really one of the interesting, you know, really one of the goals was to try and and get as much control um, as, as enough hegemony to really um, 
gain control over some of the trade networks and get access into some of that. So I, I think there maybe wasn't as much of a need to push as far south, um, you know, thinking about how far some of these groups were coming. And uh, they had sort of accomplished their goals, I think, is, is maybe one way of thinking about it. Um, I'm, there's, like anything with these sorts of, of questions, it was a, it was a lot of, there were a lot of complexities to it. So my, my simple answer is probably just that. But um, I think it was, it was really trying to figure out what exactly those goals were and whether or not they could accomplish them without having to go this far south. All right, and we got another good one. Was it common for Native Americans to live in or right next to English early settlements as shown in the initial drawing of the fort? Seems like that might have been a dicey, seems like it might have been dicey for the war settlers. I mean, it's it was, um, it was a, a situation that had benefits for both groups initially. You know, I, I think that when I talked about Juanus and sort of his motivation, I don't think there was any, there was anyone in that, that organization, you know, the, the Piscataway were not immune. They were not ignorant of what was happening at other places. They knew, you know, when the Virginia colonists came, they came to stay and they saw that they had, they had been witnessing it for a generation. And so I don't think they saw the Marylanders as necessarily a temporary uh, group. And, but what they did bring was material culture that could be, could be brought in trade. And for the Ecomico in particular, um, who, who seem to, at least the, and the colonial records tell us, which again, colonial records are, are giving us one perspective of this. The colonial records suggest that the Okomoko had intimated that they were thinking about moving on um, in any case, that they were, they were maybe going to migrate to a different area because again, they've been suffering some of these raids from Susquehannocks coming down in Chesapeake and, and various other groups. So there was an opportunity there perhaps to, to gain some benefits, to gain a potential ally against the Susquehannocks. That was another consideration of could, could these, these new Maryland English folk um, help them against their enemies? What quickly happened was things got ugly, right? You know, by, by 1638, the Jesuits are writing, uh, writing some letters back to folks in England, basically saying they're not supposed to be going among the native people anymore because there's been violence, there's been disease. And in 1642, the English colonist John Elkin actually murders the the uh, Werewants of the Okomiko. Um, and and the, the motivation is unrecorded. It's not remarked upon. Um, and it's a it's a fascinating trial and everything that comes out of that. But there's it doesn't take too long before before the relations kind of turn south. And so um, I'm not convinced that they were Yakomiko living in the fort necessarily, but I think they certainly had a presence sort of moving in and out of that space, um, providing we know they were they were coming to provide meat and uh, furs in trade, and that that continued throughout the 17th century, that there was continued contact. It wasn't like the, the colonists came, there was a big, you know, great conflict and the native people were gone somehow. They were always present in this area, but their land was being encroached upon. Um, there were episodes of violence, but there were also episodes of, of trade and diplomacy. It was, it was a really complex situation throughout the 17th century. And of course, the Piscataway people have, have remained, you know, all those roots are preserved and, and today, uh, Piscataway people make up a, a integral part of, of Maryland. All right, and this one's a kind of a comment, kind of a question. I'll throw it up there. In, in some ways, I look at all these fort sites and wonder why they were considered by the original colonists. Yeah, I think we, you know, when you think about where you're settling and why, um, you know, I think in, in Maryland's case, they, they certainly learned from the Jamestown situation. You know, maybe a swamp is not the best place to settle. You want to be sure you've got some fresh water. And, and that's what's, you know, St. Mary City really is a, uh, you know, I say it's been a place, a great place to settle for a long period of time because it's, you're about 40 feet above the water line. So you're not going to, you're not going to be flooded out. Um, you've got natural springs all over the place. There's, there's natural springs kind of dotting the landscape. So you've got fresh water, you've got access to rivers, but you're not on a, you know, large enough, uh, you know, riverway that you're necessarily going to be invaded on the, you know, sort of first blush. Um, so, the, and there's, there's all these natural resources, there's riverine resources, there's um, game, you know, throughout the woods. And in the case of Yakomiko, colonists actually comment on how when they arrived, they found the land cleared to their hands, meaning the Yakomiko had already knocked down a lot of the forest because it's a lot of work to uh, remove a lot of that forestation. And so obviously the colonists need wood to build their structures but cleared land meant that they could immediately start planting crops. And uh, it was, it was really you know, pretty optimal. And, and I think, I think a lot of that is, is due to Henry Fleet, you know, the, the guy who had, had been you know, moving throughout this area, 
um, as kind of a free agent, um, you know, learning Algonquian, trying to establish fur trade relations with a lot of these different groups. He was the one who really seemed to push Calvert and the, the Maryland group down to Yokomico because uh, it kind of fit a lot of their needs. All right. Here's a good one that we, you and I and Henry have, have discussed before. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would say erosion is the key factor there on the north side. Um, if you go out on the landscape today, it, it almost bowls down on the north side. There's sort of a, a depression out there, a ravine that likely, at least part of it was likely original to the 17th century, but it seems like it's probably widened and softened um, up there. And I think that's probably taken away a portion of the evidence of the fort on that north side. It's also right up against the tree line. So I know Tim, when he did his his survey, he didn't go, uh, you know, into the woods necessarily um, to to really get in there, and and I don't know if he would have found much else at that time. But yeah, we've got some real erosion issues on that north side, but but so much of the the fort being present is such a an asset to us. You know, that was one of the the considerations was have we lost this thing to the riverbank? You know, some people wondered if it was over the traditional site, have we lost it into the St. Mary's? And fortunately, we've only lost about 30, 40 feet of the the shoreline on that side of things. But um, yeah, we've definitely suffered some erosion on the north side. The archaeology is showing us that, you know, where we're digging right now is over on that kind of that red, uh, angry looking rectangle that I talked about, the cellared building. Um, and in that area, that's pretty close to that where the erosion starts. So um, yeah, we've definitely lost some to erosion there, unfortunately. All right. And this one is a reference to a, a later event that happened involving a different fort, but what role, if any, did this fort, the St. Mary's Fort, play in Ingalls Rebellion? Yeah, as far as we know, this fort was probably no longer present on the landscape um, at that time. It's a, it's a really good question, and it seems like the, the life cycle of St. Mary's Fort petered out right before Ingalls Rebellion in 1645. Um, you know, you've got Governor Calvert basically booting people out of the fort in 1642-43. Um, what, what work I've done in looking at the, the General Assembly records, there are 18 references to St. Mary's Fort in those records. And the last one is in you know, 1643. I wanna say I'd have to check my notes to be sure, but they really start to peter out by the early 1640s. And most of them are, even those later records are referring to events from two or three years ago. You know, X happened at Fort St. Mary's or so-and-so got met at the, the Fort at St. Mary's, that kind of thing. So I think by the time uh, Governor's Field Land has, has really been, um, has been patented, in 1641, I think you're, you're really seeing the lifespan of that fort starting to end, which is, again, part of the reason why it was a challenge to find, because it didn't have this massive density of material culture that we, we often associate with later sites. All right, next we got a good technical question. Uh, it's a two-parter. Um, great presentation, Travis. Any plans to use XRF and analysis uh, on the copper alloy tinkling? Or are you guys thinking that it could be made of bronze or pure copper? That's a really great question. And I would love to throw some some XRF at that object. Um, again, it, it came out of the ground on Friday, so it's not it's not even a week a week old. Um, but yeah, that was one of my first thoughts. I know um, Carter Hudgens, um, I think it was his, it was either his MA or his PhD dissertation at Jamestown did some really cool work on looking at colonial copper. I know there's been a lot of people who have looked at, um, taken scientific approaches to looking at, at colonial copper. So, or, or excuse me, um, you know, sort of uh, what I hate to call the contact period, but the, the arrival period, um, looking at copper um, and, and trying to figure out a, a manufacturing source. So yeah, I think we'll definitely start to investigate what avenues are available to us on the scientific side for that object because they don't come up very often. The, um, I was talking to, to Henry Miller about this uh, earlier in the week and he was telling me that the, the other place where he's seen tinkling cones on our property is, is over at Chancellor's Point, which um, you know we, we feel pretty good about uh, as a, a blacksmithing operation in sort of the maybe just post fort period, um, blacksmithing operation likely, likely operated by uh, infamous colonist John Dandy and so it, the, if the idea is that as part of a blacksmithing operation, Dandy is maybe ripping up some of these copper kettles and to converting them into tinkling cones. We know Dandy also had an operation at the fort um, prior to that. So could this be a similar operation that's sort of getting moved around the landscape? I think we'll have to really do a lot of, of testing and, and research to, to feel good about that. But it's, it's really cool to have something that we can chase out uh, and something that just, again, just came out very recently. 
And, and before I get to the next question, uh, it's not often I can have a shameless a, a shameless plug for a program that my department runs from a, a, a nice technical question like this. But if you're wondering why John Dandy is infamous. Uh, we have a program called Murder Magic, Mis uh, Murder Magic and Mayhem later in this year in October that we hopefully can do, and you can learn more about why John Dandy is infamous. Absolutely. So, uh, thank you for bearing with me there. Next question is a good one. What types of items were traded with the settlers? Where did the settlers come from? Yeah, so the the settlers were really interested in in, in the earliest period in food um, because it, it it was helpful to you know provide uh, you know game um, particularly we've got evidence and that that continues into the 17th century. We know that folks like John Luger, the colony's first secretary, uh, contracted with some native people in the area to hunt um, hunt game for him. So providing food, but furs was really one of the the big ones. The, at this time, the fur trade was was very profitable. You know, got the French up north who were really uh, are really doing big things with that. Certainly the Russians out on the West Coast uh, eventually start to really hit that up high. And so um, furs were, were something the colonists were very keen on. You see uh, that was something that Henry Fleet um, was really, really interested in trying to get. Um, uh, William Claiborne, you know, up on, on uh, Kent Island was really interested in, in the fur trade. So that was, those were some of the, the main items that they were, they were really interested in. And, and in that initial voyage, most of the colonists were, were English. Um, uh, you know, that's where most of your, your colonists are arriving from with, you know, the exception of a few people that we know about, one being Matthias de Souza, um, who was a, a fascinating figure who was um, of, of mixed ancestry, uh, likely Portuguese and African ancestry. And he came over as an indentured servant, indentured to Father Andrew White, and ended up um, actually voting in the General Assembly in 1642, becoming the first uh, person of African ancestry to participate in colonial governance. Um, but other than than De Souza and some you know a few other figures here and there in that early period, most of the colonists were were coming from England. And it's as the 17th century wears on where we start to see a, a, a vast you know European diversity of people coming from uh, from France, Italy, the Netherlands, um, uh, various areas of Scandinavia. Um, so you start to see that diversity, uh, European diversity again, sort of pick up over time throughout the 17th century. Excellent. And then we have another one that, again, you, Henry, and I have discussed and other people recently. Uh, since the fort backs up to the small creek, what was that creek and an entrance to it like in the 17th century? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, if you go out there today, you can kind of walk down that ravine that I mentioned on the north side and, and you get to just sort of a marshy, nasty kind of looking area. Um, but it is a freshwater stream. So the, the water is is... I suppose if you wanted to, uh, clean to drink. And it likely would have been a lot deeper back in the 17th century. There was a, a geological study that was done in the late 80s uh, where a couple of geologists took cores in areas of that creek and, and um, estimated that it was likely at least probably six to nine feet deep, maybe upwards of 10, 10 feet deep um, in the 17th century. So it probably would have been navigable by really low draft, small vessels. You know, you're not sailing the Ark of the Dove up that, that creek, but you could have certainly offloaded supplies um, from the river. And again, it's it's a it's a key water source. So it likely um, was a place where people were were traveling. I, I imagine that ravine was actually, you know, as it's walked today, was likely walked in the 17th century. Um, so even though we lost some of that northern wall to erosion, um, we were, you know, again, Peter and Henry and I were talking about, you know, would there have been a gate on that side to provide access down to the water? And my instinct is probably yes. There are probably a couple gates, but that north side will be a logical place for them. All right, here's a, a, another one, just in case. Uh, I think it'd be good just to reiterate this, the answer to this one. Yeah, so the fort went out of use around, um, you know, 16, early 1640s, 41, 42, 43. Um, the question of would it have been visible or not, probably not, you know, that's that's that timber likely, you know, if you don't maintain a palisade wall like that, it's, it will eventually start to wobble and decay and, and fall over. And, and we can tell from the archeology span that, it was either pulled, but likely decayed. Those timbers were likely uh, actually decayed partially in place because we've got really good soil stains um, in that palisade trench. So I would guess no. It was it was likely not visible when when Gareth Van Swearingen arrived. Yeah, I would I would think so too. Seeing how many fences I've gone through uh, since I've worked at the museum. Oh yeah. Yep. Here's another good one. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Yes, absolutely. Um, the Jesuits were certainly interested, as you know, as as they have been throughout history, in in missionizing. We know that Father Andrew White actually lived uh, with the the 
Piscataway leadership for a time um, when they were, were permitted to do so. So there was certainly uh, missionary work afoot that was a key component of the, the colonial endeavor writ large, but certainly for the Jesuits was um, you know, spreading, uh, spreading the Christian religion. Um, and so you see that in a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of history tells us that there were various, um, you know, Jesuits like to, to write a lot about various uh, baptism efforts and, um, you know, their, their, their work to really uh, missionize. And, and that's one of the questions is, is some of that material culture that we're finding part of that missionizing effort? You know, you, um, there are a lot of reasons one might have a, a religious medal on them, um, but one of them might be to try and give it as a token to someone who you're trying to spread the importance of that religion to. So things like rosaries, um, religious medals were, particularly for the Jesuits, um, were a key kind of tool of, of spreading that, that part of their culture. And uh, later on, the same person, Cecily asks, you know, says she hopes her question wasn't straying too far from archaeology, more into history. And um, I think we're all covered here. We're, we're, we like history, we like, we yeah. like archaeology, and okay. Travis is a historical archaeologist. So he, he delves in the documents just as much as he does in the dirt. So Absolutely. Uh, next, we got another technical question from Wayne Clark, mm -hmm. who I believe was uh, executive director of the Maryland Historic Trust. And uh, the last part of the question, I don't know if you can see this, Travis, is in the late Woodland Eastern, uh, in the late Woodland East cluster, was the native pottery mostly of that type being the shell tempered? I wish I could say yes. Um, you know, that, that was one of the questions that I had when I started looking at the data. And I was really hoping we were going to find a, a strong concentration of Yokomiko uh, pottery. Um, there's a few pieces. And I, when I say a few, there's like six <laughs> that have been found out there in the mill field. Um, but again, it wasn't, you know, the, the amount of work that was done out there prior to, to our work was not intensive in the area where the, uh, the various site components were identified. So we may find more as we excavate. But in that, that deposit, it was, it was stuff that was more um, kind of middle, late woodland, but not Yokomiko. Um, we didn't, again, not a lot of that in the mill field. So it's not like we can look at a concentration and be like, boom, that's, that's a Yokomiko you know, the village of Yokomiko house there. Um, unfortunately, not at this time. I mentioned, I sort of alluded earlier to this idea that we we're going to bring um, Tim Horsley back, which is really a, an exciting aspect of the sort of the next steps for this project. Uh, Dr. Horsley is going to be coming back to our, our landscape in the summer, and he's going to be doing another ground penetrating radar survey, but this time he's going to survey everything outside of the fort in the mill field. There's going to be a huge survey, going to cover a large area, including those two areas where the surface collection identified uh, some native site components. So we're really hoping that that might show um, a little bit of, of the nature of those sites, whether they're campsites, whether there's a couple of witch odds, you know, whatever we might find. And certainly we're going to find continued evidence of the, the um, kind of late 17th century uh, city. You know, the, that was the other, the other element that I didn't have time to go over is, yes, we found this massive palisaded enclosure. We also found about eight buildings in the survey area that date to the 1660s, 1670s, almost certainly based on how they're oriented in accordance with the Baroque town plan of St. Mary City. And so we're really looking forward to seeing uh, you know, the, the diversity of, of material and sites that Tim's going to identify when he comes back this summer. All right. So we're, we're getting lots of questions, everybody, and I'm trying to keep up and um, uh, see how long we can go, how long we're all up for this. Um, and I'm going to switch over to my email because I just noticed I've got some questions there that I have forgotten about. So here's a good one that I'm going to read. Uh, what do we know of religious buildings within the fort or in its environs? And fast forwarding to the broke layout of the city with its physical separation of church and state, were these specific cities and were there specific cities in Europe that served as inspiration for the Calverts? That's a, that's a really great, both both great questions. Um, as far as religious buildings in the fort, the, the best reference we have is, is like I mentioned, Father Andrew White's sort of tantalizing note about, um, he's, he's sort of going through and describing what he's observed of the native people in the region. And he mentions, you know, this is how they build their structures. They're so high, they're so wide. Um, they're covered in, in uh, you know, grasses and all this sort of stuff. And he says, oh, and by the way, this is where we're holding uh, mass until we get our our chapel built, which is just a fascinating little detail. And so um, I, you know, the, the records tell us that the first mass was held, obviously we have the mass that's held at St. Clement's, but the first mass that's held here at St. Mary City, um, or at least the first series of masses seems to have been held in a witch hut. And so um, 
how you piece that apart archaeologically will be a challenge. Um, but uh, certainly he refers to a chapel being, you know, sort of under construction. We know the brick chapel that's across Route 5, you know, the reconstructed one that we have today built on the remains of the, uh, the 1660s um, brick chapel. There was at least one, possibly two timber frame buildings in the vicinity of that that were likely earlier iterations of the chapel. So is one of those the first sort of English timber frame chapel um, that the that Father White and uh, sort of com commissioned along with the, the rest of the Jesuits to have a, a place of worship there? Um, it's a good question. I mean, the, the idea of having buildings, particularly religious buildings, built in a similar place, you know, you're not sort of populating your landscape with with chapels, that you build one and when, when it needs to be repaired, you build another on that same ground because that ground has taken on sort of the sacred nature to it. That makes a lot of sense. So um, I'm not sure what we'll find in the in the fort. Obviously, we have the geophysics, which suggests the locations of some buildings. Um, you know, obviously, I hope we find a remains of a job that's got 25 Jesuit medals on top of it. That would be awesome. But, um, you know, short of that, we'll have to have to really see what the archaeology tells us. Um, on the subject of the Baroque plan, uh, I think Rome was certainly a, a big a big uh, case study. We know that the, and, and, and I'm stepping on Henry Miller's research toes here, so he can tell you a lot more about this because he's done some really foundational work on this, this subject. But um, what Henry found was that um, uh, the surveyor, Jerome White, uh, had his family had ties to uh, institutions in Rome that they, um, you know, sort of ran in circles with some of the big scientists um, who were running around Europe at this time and um, that they, their family had spent time in Rome, you know, and, and I think you can really see some of that Baroque planning that uh, we tend to associate with Rome and various other places uh, really evident on, on the landscape here. So I think that's probably a, a really key tie there. Um, and, but again, Henry, Henry can speak to that more eloquently than I can. All right, I've got two more questions from my email, then I'm gonna switch over to the YouTube questions. Okay. Um, the next question, I think I, either either one of us could answer, is, is the site open for visitation? And Yes, the, yes. Site, the site is open for visitation um, when it's not raining. Of course, you know, the archaeologists run from the rain, but um, we, are, we are out there when the museum is open. Um, we are out Tuesday through Friday. So those are the days, you, you know, if you can get your ticket for the museum, you can come out and see what we have going on out there. Um, the archaeology team usually takes lunch between 12 and 1, so I recommend you come between 10 and noon or 1 and like 3.30 because we close up around 4. Um, but yes, we are out there, and, and Peter's staff is, is preparing some really exciting tour opportunities um, that he can talk about um, that will, will help bring people over to the floor. Yeah, we're, we're almost done drafting a, a tour. Uh, we're going to be sending it to Travis to, to review it himself and, and go over it with his staff over on the, the site so that the way they know what the expectations are for the tour for both of us uh, departments, for the tour leaders and the archaeologists. And we should hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping to get this, this tour going in the next couple of weeks, um, starting off with offering it two days a week uh, at 11 and 1. And it would be going over to the fort site and also including parts of the town center, specifically the Calvert House site, and, and just really bring the two sides of the museum together, the landscape, because remember in the 17th century, Route 5 didn't exist. And so it's really one landscape we're dealing with. So the goal of this, this tour is to, is to really highlight the people-to-people -people nature, that there are, are multiple groups of people, different cultures involved in what happens to them over the course of the 17th century, not just focused on, on the fort site. So um, good question. Another good question is, did the geophysics outline any internal features besides the English and prehistoric houses, cellars, wells, roads? Yeah, the um, we, we didn't get a lot in the way of, you know, other than architecture, um, you know, dwellings. We've got, you know, another possible small cellar, very small, um, a few pits, some hearths, the magnetometry, the one thing that that did really pull up for us were some some hearths or areas of really high heating, you know, possibly industrial level heating, maybe associated with blacksmithing. Um, so we've got some of those those things to to look at. What's kind of interesting about that survey was um, the middle portion of the fort, almost like the middle third of it, there's way, way uh, far fewer things that really came out, far fewer anomalies, you know, posts and pits and all that sort of stuff. 
Um, so there may have been kind of an open space in the middle, which is hard to imagine when you're cramming 150 plus people into a space of this size. But, you know, the, um, I don't know if Tim would, would like me saying this, but the geophysics gives us a really great idea of what's below the ground, but you really have to excavate to, to find these things. And I think the archaeology, as it already has done, is going to show us things that, that didn't show up in the geophysics, and we're going to find things that we didn't expect. And uh, that's one of the fun parts about, about being out there. All right, so we got a, a long question that I really want to go into. Um, we've hinted at this, and I think this is very important. Um, I'd like to hear more about the people to people project and how you are approaching collaboration with the Piscataway and other indigenous communities currently and previously living in the region. What is your approach to involving these communities, and how are you working to promote research values like shared authority in research direction and interpretation? Thank you for the great question, Chris Rico, um, field school class of 2019, who helped us find this important uh, this important site and is doing some really important collaborative work of his own uh, up in Minnesota. So thanks for the question, Chris. Um, this has been a a, a gradual process, um, and it's it's something that we at St. Mary City haven't done a lot of, but we're we're trying to do outreach um, in, in kind of bits and pieces. We started with a series of, of kind of informal uh, meetings where just we, we reached out to members of the community, some of which we've worked with before on, on really important projects. Like we've been um, redesigning our, our visitor center exhibits for our new uh, interpretive center, our new visitor center that's gonna be built uh, over the next couple of years. And as part of that process of redesigning the entire way we exhibit early Maryland history, we had uh, members from the Piscataway Canoe Tribe um, in particular, working with us. So we're trying to build on those relationships and also establish relationships with other other groups in the area. And some of this is just a matter of saying, um, you know, we haven't involved uh, members of the Native community as much as we should have in the past. And we're here now, and we hope that you'll you'll sit with us and work with us, and we can we can have conversations about what this history means to all of us. Uh, and that's really how we're trying to approach it: is being as open and as honest as we possibly can. And um, not move too fast in one direction, in any one direction. Um, the, the limited excavations that have been con conducted so far, there's the reason I targeted that cellar building surrounded by what looked like sort of the grid of posts is because it looked definitively English. It looked definitively European. Um, we won't be doing any archaeology on areas that look definitively native without, the, without our, our colleagues arm in arm with us. And um, how we approach that as far as you know, the day-to-day -day operation the season to season operation, the kinds of things that need to be done before we put shovels in the ground from a, a cultural standpoint, um, all of that is done you know, or will be done um, or not done according to uh, our, what comes out of the conversations with our, our constituents. And um, you know, COVID certainly put a, threw a wrench in all of this. We haven't done a lot of in-person uh, meetings and we're looking forward to, to setting up um, what our, one of our, our projects team members, Rico Newman has called talking circles, you know, to, to really get people together and continue these conversations because our, our feeling is the more we talk, the more we share, the more we're honest with each other, um, the better it's gonna be for all of us. Um, I think we have some really exciting ideas and we have, um, you know, we've, we've already been talking about events that can be held, um, the way we're going to structure our narratives, um, how we're going to come about, you know, how we're going to design public programming all of that is going to be done, you know, hand in hand um, and, and with a lot of voices at the table. Um, some of the other ways that we're working to do this is through grant writing and seeking funding to um, hire on members of the Native community. Not, so it's not, you know, we don't want to ask people's time without compensation. So that's something we've been working on uh, lately and we've been making some some strides in that realm as well. So, um, Chris, it's, it's not the, the most straightforward answer to your question, but um, I would say we're still in the early days, and I think the next year is really going to be um, really telling for us as we, we really try and build these relationships and, and create kind of our working group that's going to help guide this, this investigation moving forward. And if I may add on, on my end, um, we're, we're, the education department at the museum focuses with the interpretation with our interpreters, the living history programs and exhibits. We work um, hand in hand with the research department, Travis. Um, and Travis and I try to be very collaborative and understanding and, and we may be slow at times with our interpret the changes in the interpretation, but we want to get it right. We want to be respectful of what, what the research tells us and working with our partners. So um, 
that's what I have to say about that. Not going too much detail, but we want to we want to be methodical and thoughtful and and honest. Um, I want to go on to another question. I want to put it up here, but I see Cheryl B has asked a number of questions, so thank you, Cheryl. Um, and the last question I see, um, I want to go ahead and answer it is, what is the name of the museum? The museum is Historic St. Mary's City. Um, and so you can, you can Google Historic St. Mary's City and find our website, hsmcdigshistory.org. Um, I can put that up later on, um, but you can go to our website and find out a lot about us and come visit us, I hope. But I'll let Travis answer this question. Right. Yeah, so yes. um, Africans captured as slaves entering St. Mary's in 1642. Um, what that that date, that's a really great question, and it's one that we've we've gotten a lot. And and the, the tricky thing with these records, looking at colonial records, is that they don't always tell the full story. There is absolutely a record from 1642 that talks about a, an exchange made between uh, Leonard Calvert, again, Maryland's first governor, and uh, a guy who's, who's a, identified in the records as a mariner, essentially a ship's captain, uh, named John Skinner. And the agreement is Calvert is going to give Skinner uh, a couple plots of land in exchange for 17 enslaved Africans. And the ages are given of, of each of these individuals. Um, and it's specified, you know, the, the breakdown of male, female. And um, the thing about that record, it, it looks for all the world like a, like it has been a completed exchange. But the issue comes when you look at Governor Calvert's probate inventory, because he dies in, in uh, 40, 1647, five years later. And when you look at his probate inventory, which tallies all the stuff in his estate, it includes the pieces of land that he was supposed to give to Skinner, and it does not include any enslaved African people. So what I would say is, is that 1642 is not a hard and fast date, because it doesn't look like that exchange ever happened between Calvert and Skinner. It looked like they agreed to it and something happened where it fell through. Um, now that's not to say that there weren't efforts. Beginning in, in the, the early 1630s, indeed even before the colonists arrived, there's letters going back, back and forth between members of the Calvert family, particularly with folks um, in Virginia. Richard Kemp, who's the secretary of Virginia, writes a letter um, to uh, Lord Baltimore basically saying like, I got your request for um, horses, pigs, cattle, and enslaved Africans. Um, we can't send you any at this time because we don't we don't have enough. But it's basically documenting the attempts that were being made by members of the Calvert family and certainly other uh, very wealthy Marylanders, the, the, the kinds of sort of the one percenters who could afford to purchase enslaved people who were trying to sort of get the wheels in motion on the slave trade in this colony. And we know from, from colonial legislation that's passed in beginning in the, the 1630s, again, the first few years of settlement, there are references in laws to the status of, of enslaved people. So there's laws referring to enslaved people, but we don't have records of slave trade. So what that tells me is that there are some number of enslaved people in the colony beginning from the earliest period. The wealthiest people in the colony are trying to, to introduce enslaved people into the colony. And that it's by the mid 17th and later 17th century where you start to see sort of the, uh, yeah, I hate to call it, but the engine of, of chattel slavery start to rev up and the numbers of the enslaved people entering the colony start to tick up higher now. I think they're present from the earliest the earliest periods. We just don't have a really good hard and fast date on when that, that first uh, importation was. And on a, as a follow-up, um, something else to think about is, is the, the trade in Native Americans as enslaved peoples as well throughout the Maryland, the Chesapeake, and other English colonies too. Absolutely, yeah, that was something the colonists sort of, um, I would say, dabbled in. You know, and and um, the the trade in in Native peoples between tribes and and between you know with Europeans in Virginia and in Maryland was certainly something that was happening. We have reference to that um, even into the 1650s, 1660s. We don't think the numbers were were as high, but it certainly was the thing that was happening. Um, throughout the colony, throughout the 17th century. All right, so let me go back to my email because I think there might be no no emails there. So moving on to another more technical archaeological question. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, what are the kinds of ceramics are we finding? We're seeing a lot of of 
I, I would say we're seeing a lot of later 17th century ceramics. You know, like I like our site. Um, you know, is so complex because it's it's got layers and layers and layers. The later 17th century has a strong presence out there in the mill field. So we're finding things like uh, Staffordshire slipwares and um, you know English stonewares, things that sort of date to the the latter half of the 17th century. On the early side, we found some pieces of um, or what what could be early. Um, Iberian olive jars um, is something that we found in, in um, pretty significant numbers, you know, relatively speaking, including a piece that was found in the Palisade Trench. It was the only ceramic that came out of the Palisade Trench was a piece of Iberian olive jar. Um, we've got a lot of, of tin glazes, which again, could be early, could be later. Um, but, uh, and, and a, I'd say a small fraction of pipe stems. We're not finding pipe stems in the numbers that we find them at other sites around our landscape. Um, so they're, they're coming in smaller numbers and those that we're finding are uh, quite large, large bores. So um, suggesting an early day, but we don't have a stati statistically significant enough sample to really, uh, really answer that question. We haven't found some of those great early ones that we tend to associate um, on our site, the really rare ones like marbleized Italian slipware, um, you know, various... Uh, various other sort of French ceramics that, that date to the really early period. But we are seeing some stonewares that are some, excuse me, some earthenwares that are likely um, manufactured in London at, at an early date. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good mix. All right. It looks like we're pretty much done with some questions. A few comments um, such as uh, a palisade defense must have taken up a lot of timber. It, it would have. It, it definitely would have. Um, and we actually know from the records of the colonists, while they were waiting for Governor Calvert to kind of do his negotiations with Lawrence when hanging out at Clement Island, they started cutting timber on St. Clement's Island to use in building the fort. So some of the, the, those original timbers are St. Clement's Island timbers. And another so, interesting I one. Saw, I just saw Cheryl's, Cheryl's question about, uh, it's I, Iberian olive jar, so likely coming from Portugal or uh, the sort of border with, with Spain, Cheryl. Oh, thank you for catching that, Travis. Yep. Um, and then another one that's always, I, I find fascinating. I, I've been to places in, up in Canada that there were French Jesuits exploring there as well. Um, you know, the French Jesuits were exploring the Minnesota region with the fur trade um, and, um, in France. So um, for anybody who happens to be able to get to Canada or for anybody who's in Canada, I'd like to, to plug uh, St. Marie among the Huron, another cool living history museum with archeo ni nice archaeological evidence that ties very similar to, to us, but just with the French flavor instead of the English. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, have you found uh, any coins or buttons? Buttons, definitely. We've got um, you know probably four or five copper alloy buttons. Um, we we haven't. We're still in the process of of getting all of our material into the lab, of course. So um, we haven't yet identified if those are you know, what what period of the 17th century those date to. Um, coinage is is really rare. You know, at this time there's not a really an established currency system, and so mostly what you tend to see are exchanges done in pounds of tobacco. Uh, and so you have this sort of elaborate credit system that evolves uh, really quickly in the 17th century where people are, are sort of exchanging labor and goods and services for uh, pounds of tobacco. And it's not until really in the 1650s, 60s, where the Calvert family sort of starts to try and say, you know, we've got to start accepting coinage at, at ordinaries and other sorts of places. Um, but so, yeah, we don't tend to find a lot of, of coinage on our sites, um, you know, for, for better or for worse. Right, and this looks to be the last question. Sure. Um, so yeah, a tinkling cone is is named for the sound that they make when they sort of uh, bang together because it's like a really thin sheet of copper um, that gets sort of wrapped in a cone such that the the sides don't overlap, um, and you string it on a um, like a cord of of leather with a knot in it. So you string it up through that. It kind of hangs off. Some, um, there's records of, of native people wearing them in their hair, on their clothing. There's some sites in, um, you know, particularly in, in French colonial sites, where European colonists are wearing uh, some of these things. They're sort of adopting some of these these um, native forms of attire in, in really interesting ways. And so, yeah, it's it's a it's sort of a, a piece of jewelry or personal adornment named for the sound that they make when they they kind of bang into each other. So it's a really interesting and kind of unique object.
All right. Well, it, it, I think that's all we've got for, for questions. I got one last email. Um, I'd like to read it because uh, just the history behind everything that we've done, the, the, you know, it's not just the history that we study, but the institutional history that we have in memories. And uh, this is from a Richard Cox. Great job. I was part of the excavation teams there in 1971 and 72 roaming around with Henry Miller in the later year. I remember discussion about the fort, and here we are half a century later, exciting, hope to get down there for a visit. And Richard, I hope you get to make down for a visit. I'm sure you can still contact Henry, and I'm sure he'd be happy to hear from you. Absolutely. Oh, another person just came in. Last, all right, this is uh, involving Matthias D'Souza. I'm wondering if there could be any connection between Shepardic Jews trading for the Iberian, Iberian Peninsula and HSMC because of the Iberian, Iberian Peninsula jars. Um, I'm not sure we can say definitively. Spanish olive jars or Iberian olive jars were one of those things that really sort of made the rounds in the Atlantic world. They were very common containers that were used in exchanges all across um, you know, the, the Atlantic Rim. You see them particularly heavily in Spanish colonial sites down in Florida and South Carolina. Um, uh, a lot of them at Jamestown. You know, these are, they're pretty common items. I'm not sure we can say definitively that there's any connection with the Sephardic Jewish population in the Iberian Peninsula. I'm, sh I'm sure some of, some of that population were, were involved in some capacity, but it's not something I'd feel comfortable saying definitively. All right. Well, I, I think on that note, um, we've, we've kept people going for, uh, well, we're, we're uh, uh, quite a bit of time, um, about 45 minutes, 60, uh, 50 minutes past when we typically do when we do live lectures. And it looks like we've maintained a pretty steady audience of uh, 80 to 100 people. Um, I thank you all for, for joining us. Um, I think Travis, thank you for taking the time uh, to speak with us and give us more information about, about the project, some more details. I hope... Uh, all of you out there who, you know, for everyone who lives nearby in Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, Pennsylvania, you know, if you live within three hours, it's an, it's an easy drive down, come out, visit, see the site. Um, for those of you living elsewhere, check out our website, keep abreast of, of all the research. Um, and hopefully you can make plans to come visit Southern Maryland. It is a beautiful place. There's lots of uh, good uh, things besides history to do. So I hope you can make it. So with that, I will say good night and uh, good luck, everybody. Have a, have a good evening. Thanks, everyone.